You know, sometimes uh, when you're waiting for a subway in New York City, it seems like it's never going to show up. And you wait and you wait and you wait. And more and more people are coming to the platform and you wonder even if it shows up, is there going to be a seat? Can I actually sit down on this subway? <clears throat> and uh, sometimes it seems to be delayed. And we have a lot of delays in Manhattan on the subway. But I want to talk to you about uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who does everything on time. And uh, I want to ask you to uh, open your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. Because the godliest king that ruled the kingdom of Judah during this time was killed in battle in uh, 609 BCE. His name was Josiah. And he was un it was under him that there was a spiritual revival. And... Um, Part of the Torah was discovered. It was rediscovered in the Beis Hamikdash, and it was studied. And he 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 tried to stop Pharaoh Necho of Egypt from assisting Assyria in its feudal last stand, actually against Babylon, which was uh, feudal. And uh, Josiah was killed in that battle. He fought with Necho at Megiddo, which is near modern Haifa, just four years before the Babylonians defeated Necho at Karshemish in 605 BC, which uh, tipped the balances of power toward Nebuchadnezzar. Now, right now, China thinks the balance of power is being tipped toward her and away from the United States. But... Uh, uh, Listen, God has everything under control. Nebuchadnezzar was free because of that victory at Karshemish to subjugate Judah. And his subjugation of Judah started in 605 BC. But uh, around this time, uh, in the decade 608 to 598, in the history of Judah, about yeah. Habakkuk, as he's called, probably a contemporary of uh, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Obadiah, Nahum, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Roughly, roughly speaking, a contemporary. He was, he was given a prophetic vision. Hallelujah! Without a vision, the people perish. Hab Habakkuk got a vision, and. Uh, with China taking the preeminent uh, position in the world away from the United States, not only with the uh, currency, but with the military and everything else, she thinks, that's what China thinks, uh, you have to remember that God is in control and that Without a vision, you're going to perish. You've got to, you've got to get a prophetic vision, and that's what Habakkuk gets. If you open your Bible to chapter one, verse six, you find out that he's given this vision to see and to inquire why God was allowing this godless, ruthless Babylonian nation to pose a a, a greater and greater threat. To the more righteous kingdom of Judah. Uh, of course, the northern kingdom had already long ago gone into the Assyrian deportation, 722 BCE, but we're talking about Yehuda, where the Beis Hamikdash is, where the Kohanim are doing the uh, Korban sacrifices, where there's prayer going up. Uh, a more righteous nation, certainly, than Babylon. And yet Babylon is getting stronger and Yehuda is getting weaker. And uh, Habakkuk has to find out why this is going on. And you ought to be uh, on your knees praying every night. Why is China on the 
ascendancy and the United States on the descendancy, because this is the kind of thing that Habakkuk was inquiring about. And the worthless king of Yehuda, whom Jeremiah had predicted would have the burial of a donkey, uh, who had the audacity to cut up and throw into the fire the word of God, look at Jeremiah 36, verse 23, I'm talking about the murderous, idolatrous, oppressive Jehoiakim. I'm, I'm pronouncing these words the way uh, the King James readers would uh, recognize them. Jehoiakim, who was a very young man, he shouldn't have been showing such disrespect to an older person, but it was much worse than that. He was showing disrespect to the word of God, just like people are not reading it. You you give them a Bible, they thank they say thank you very sanctimoniously. They put it on the bookshelf and they don't touch it. It starts collecting dust and they don't look at it. But he was doing something worse. He was cutting it up with a scribe knife and throwing it in the fireplace. And he was a vassal of Egypt, and he uh, he thought that. Uh, this would help him against the Babylonians. And uh, he made a big mistake. A big mistake. And Habakkuk seems to be asking, my God, who's a God of justice and a protector of the righteous, why he is not acting to punish the evil uh of his society and why he's allowing the Babylonians to get stronger. And the answer comes back in verses 5 to 11 of the first chapter that God has a breathtaking answer. So astounding that few would even believe it when they were told. Uh, God is raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, uh, the more powerful, villainous army of cutthroats. Uh, we see that aircraft carrier of the Chinese in the South China Sea. We see that vast army they have. We, we see the uh, cutthroats the villainous army, uh, and uh, we see that possibly they are being raised up to punish. Possibly uh, they're being raised up uh, to be a nemesis to bring uh, justice, uh, the justice of the Lord. And so uh, we have to ask God, uh, are we in a Habakkuk situation right now in the world? 2023. Uh, and uh, Habakkuk's complaint is very simple. How can God justify allowing a people like the Babylonians who are wicked or we would say the Chinese, the communists of mainland China, who are determined to reunify Taiwan, etc., even if it costs war, even world war. How can God justify allowing a people more wicked than another people? In other words, the Babylonians are more wicked than the Jews. How can he allow them to be his punitive agents and allow them, uh, you know, they're godless fishers of men, quote unquote. And they seem, they seem to have open season. Look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Uh, on the people of God. And how can God be silent when the wicked swallow those more righteous than they are and just swallow them up? This is not right. Habakkuk is saying, surely. Uh, Everyone can agree that the Babylonians are unrighteous. 
Their own might is their God. Verse 11, chapter 1 of Habakkuk. And the only quote-unquote justice they acknowledge is what proceeds from themselves. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone our own way. They've gone their own way. They're going to do their own thing. And Habakkuk trusts the Lord, and he patiently, confidently waits for the answer. And then the answer comes in chapter 2, verse 2, going all the way to chapter 3, verse 19. And basically the answer is that the dog-eat-dog -dog manner in which wicked nations weary themselves against each other, like Russia is wearying herself against Ukraine, will not profit them. Putin is not going to get any profit from what he's doing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, Habakkuk 2.14. And in the midst of all this villainy, wicked men trust themselves and, uh, and they die. Just as Paul says, Romans 1, 24, that part of the penalty of sin is that is, is in the sin itself. For when God gives a man over to his own ugly sin, he becomes an ugly sinner. And if a man or a woman practices perversion, he or she becomes a pervert. And if, if one sins himself and gives himself over to vanity, he becomes a narcissistic bore. If he gives himself over to gluttony, he becomes an obese glutton. If he gives himself over to liquor, he becomes a falling down drunk. If he gives himself over to violence, he becomes a heartless butcher. So the, the sin that you are is what we're talking about, not just the sin that you do. The arrogant do not endure, it says, Habakkuk 2.5. They have forfeited their life, Habakkuk 2.10. The enemies they are creating will eventually arise to settle the score, and the destroyers, like the Babylonians, will themselves be destroyed. Chapter 2, verses 7 and 8 of Habakkuk. Look at that. The righteous, however, will live by personal faith in God. Habakkuk 2.4. You, you want to stay alive? You better read the Bible. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. And that's why we're giving the Yiddish uh, Tanakh to the ultra-Orthodox Jews. We've gone back 100 years, and we found a wonderful man named Mortimer Shmuel Bergman. And we've dusted off his uh, archaic spelling. And we have uh, put it in the paratext, and now we are editing it. I have people helping me all over the world, and we're going to show the symphony of God. Uh, in a symphony, you have all these uh, these little themes that are established in the beginning, and then as you move toward the climax of the piece. All these themes come together in a glorious, uh, well, in the case of uh, the Tanakh, the, the glory climaxes in Isaiah 53. So if Nasa is in uh, Isaiah 53, but it starts uh, back in Leviticus 16 with the scapegoat at the Yom Kippur, what we're doing is we're putting cross-references. So when you get to that Nasa, with the scapegoat carrying the sins away, it says, see Isaiah 53. And then you get, you get there and you see Nasa again. Now it's the suffering servant carrying the sins away. And this glorious climax is happening. And, uh, and if you can read the Bible, and if God opens your eyes to understand the Bible, and if you're an Orthodox Jew who's, actually got your phone and you version and you're actually reading it 
uh, your wife doesn't know what you're doing, your rabbi doesn't know what you're doing, your kids don't know what you're doing. If they did, they would throw you out, they would divorce you, they, you would be tossed out of your business, tossed out of your house. Uh, so you would have to come like Nicodemus by night to the word of God on your phone. And you might say, well, Phil, and I, that is a pretty far out vision. What in the world prompted you to do that? Well, let me tell you something. Way back, 74 or 75, it's a little hard for me to remember because it's a little uh, a little bit foggy back that uh, when you think about it. That's almost 50 years ago. Uh, there were two guys, Art Katz and Mike Evans, who decided to have a conference at Columbia University right there where James Washington lives. And uh, they called it Shekinah 74 or Shekinah 75. I can't remember what it was. And and so I was there. And I, I was taking notes. And I went back to LaGuardia. And I got on the plane to fly back to Miami Beach. And Richard Briefstein of the Sheep's Head Sheepfold. I thought, well, you know, I've got his phone number here. I might as well give him a call. I'm sitting here waiting to get on the plane. I got a little a few minutes to kill. I might as well call Richard. So I called Richard. I said, Richard, this is Phil Goba. How you doing? I'm here in New York. How's it going? He said, wait a minute. Don't get on the plane. I'll be right there. Jumped in his car and drove out to LaGuardia. So I got it so I could take a later plane. And I waited for him. He came in. He was in the spirit. He said, Phil, listen to me very carefully. I'm having this nightmare in Brooklyn every night. What's the what's the dream? What are you what are you dreaming? Uh, Richard, he said, I'm in Williamsburg, I'm on Lee Avenue in Brooklyn, and all these Hasidic people, these Yiddish speaking Hasidic people, are walking up and down Lee Avenue, and the whole place is on fire. This is a subsection of Brooklyn, a Hasidic subsection of Brooklyn, a little shtetl. And it's all on fire. And I can see the fire, but nobody else can see it. The women, the Hasidic women, are pushing their babies. They got little children tagging along behind them. They got a big family of 10 kids. The men are wearing their strimals. They're walking down the street. And the fire is all around us, in the buildings, everywhere. And they don't even see it. And nobody's calling the fire department. Nobody is alarmed. I'm the only one that's alarmed. And then I wake up. And I have this dream every night. Uh, it's I've had it several nights in a, since I first had the dream. And I'm so burdened, Phil. You've got to you've got to do something. I said, me, I got to do something. I had written this book, Everything You Need to Grow a Messianic Synagogue, which I did by the skin of my teeth. I didn't really know what I was doing. It was just, I checked into a motel and dictated it. So he thought that I could do something. But he was weeping. And I was sitting there. Finally, he left. Now, this is 50 years ago. What does it say in Habakkuk? Chapter 2, verse 3. For the hazon is yet for a moed, an appointed time. It speaks of haketz, the end. I read from the Orthodox Jewish Bible on New Version. And does not lie. Though it tarry, though it delay, wait for him. Actually, him instead of it, because we're talking about the Moshiach here. Because he will surely come and will not tarry. Moshiach is coming, my friend. So 
I got on the plane finally to fly back to Miami Beach. The Lord was going to give me three, not one, not two, but three Messianic synagogues down there, including Temple of Aron Kodesh. Because he had Neil Lash waiting down there and I had all these people that were going to be down there with us. And I got on the plane and immediately, as soon as the plane took off, I felt this burden come over me. The best way I can describe it is like putting on an overcoat that weighs about 300 pounds. The burden of, of Richard Briefstein, the, 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 the nightmare of, of Williamsburg and Hasidic Jew, Yiddish speaking ultra Orthodox Brooklyn and the ultra Orthodox world. The final frontier of Jewish evangelism, the 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 the, the ultra orthodox Hasidic Jews uh, that came on me, the burden for their souls, the vision of the fire, nobody seeing the fire, nobody w even worried about the fire. It came on me. And that was 50 years ago. It says, though the vision, Terry, wait for it. Now, here we are 50 years later. And here we are actually doing the Yiddish Tanakh and getting ready to upload it to you version. Now, if that is not an, uh, if that is not a demonstration and an application of Habakkuk two, three, I don't know what would be. God is real, my friend. Don't, don't lose the vision. Without a vision, the people perish. Don't get caught up in movie stars, in Hollywood, in the Academy Awards in the news, uh, the news cycle about Donald Trump. Is Donald Trump going to be this? Is he going to be that? What's going to happen on Tuesday when he's uh, uh, when he's arraigned? Is there going to be a riot in New York? Blah, blah, blah. Don't, don't get to... Look, my friend, there were many things going on in Miami Beach, many things going on in New York around 1974 or 75. None of that is important now. None of it. But what is important now is the vision. The vision with which Richard Briefstein came out to LaGuardia to give me, which transferred to me. Now, many years later, I called him and I said, Richard, we're getting there. Getting where? Richard. Richard, don't you remember the, the day that, that we were talking about? Uh, uh, no, Phil, I... I Gosh, when was that now? Where were we? Uh, and, and, and you know what? He had gone off on into other things. He wasn't a uh, leader of the Sheep's Head Sheepfold. He was in a completely different mode, a different, uh, uh, he was in a completely different uh, line of work, whatever. And uh, he wasn't really on my wavelength. You see, the vision wasn't his, and the vision isn't mine. The vision is the Lord's. This is the Lord's work, my friend. Don't you put your eyes on me. I am nothing. I am nobody. Oh, hallelujah. It's the Lord. It's his vision. It's his people. Hallelujah. Do you think I know what I'm doing? Not really. Not really. Sometimes uh, my uh, consultant, my translation consultant almost pulls his hair out. Phil, Phil, what's wrong? Why aren't you getting it? Uh, you know what? If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Don't think that you're the great prophet, my friend. Don't think that you're the great mover and shaker of God. You are not, and neither am I. I just don't want to perish. I want to keep the vision in front of me. I'm not interested 
in Photo Play magazine and looking at Hollywood actors and their pictures. Photo Play magazine doesn't even exist anymore. And all those actors, they're all out in the cemetery. The world is passing away and the lust thereof. You've got to think about what God is doing. The only survivor from the cemetery is Moshiach ben Dovid. His body did not see Shahat. After the suffering of his nephesh, the Lord prolonged his days from the Kaber. If your days are prolonged from the Kaber, that means Haye Olam, eternal life. And if the Mashiach ben Dovid is going to judge the living and the dead, and he's already alive and he's ready to arraign the judgment hall, and the believers will have to stand before the Bema, and the unbelievers will have to go to the great white throne. And if in the meantime, he's already resurrected the nation of Israel. When I was five years old, he did that. And now here I am 80 years old and he's doing the Yiddish Tanakh. And you might say, wow, Phil, you're really in the center of it. I'm not in the center of it. I'm not even doing it. These people are doing it. They, uh, they, uh, Basically, uh, what we're doing is we're taking the work of, 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 of Mortimer Schmuel Bergman of the British Foreign Bible Society, which is a public domain uh, Yiddish uh, Tanakh, this guy who had a rabbinic training and then came to England and then became a believer as a very young man and then started translating the Bible. And if you look at Yehoash's translation, you'll see Yehoash had it in front of him when he was doing his work. But unfortunately, when Yehoash gets to the word Galilee, he just doesn't translate it because he doesn't want people to know, uh, at least he doesn't believe, that uh, the Galilean, those who sit in darkness have seen a great light, the, the Galilean, uh, Mashiach ben David is the Mashiach, and he's right there at the end of uh, Isaiah chapter 8, the beginning of chapter 9, uh, where it talks about Galilee of the nations. He doesn't even translate it. He's got Yehoash in front of him. I can see the plagiarism all over the place. Uh, I'm sorry, Yehoash has Bergman in front of him. I can see the, the uh, dependency all over the place. But when he comes to that, he doesn't translate it. The truth is being held down in unrighteousness. God has decided that he's going to bring the truth out. And so he's reached down into the bottom of the rat barrel to pull out the worst rat of them all. And then he's whistled for all these geniuses all over the world to come and help me. And he's given them the patience to put up with me. And it's being done and it's only being done by the Lord because on uh, in 2011, in March, when I was down there preaching on the street, and that's basically all I am. I'm just a street preacher. The rabbi came up and said, oh, I see you have that paperback in your hand, the Orthodox Jewish Bible. I've heard so much about it. Could I have a free copy? I said, certainly, my friend. And I handed it to him and I kept right on preaching. And then he went over to the corner and started ripping it up. And that night I was very discouraged. And I checked my email. This was 2011. So notice, notice, my friend, we go from 74 or 75, 25 years to get into the 21st century. And then we add another 11 years, which is 36 years from the day that Richard Briefstein gave me this vision that was given to him by the Lord with a dream and a nightmare. So 36 years later, what happens? I go home discouraged, and I get an email from Version. They want the Orthodox Jewish Bible. Now they have the Yiddish New Testament. Soon they will have the Yiddish Tanakh. So we get to 2023. Hallelujah. Almost 50 years. Hallelujah. Though the though the Hazon carry, though it delay, wait, 
Wait for the Lord. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Without a vision, the people perish. The people in the wilderness lost their vision for the promised land. They started murmuring, and their bodies littered the wilderness. Judas Iscariot lost the vision for what Moshiach was saying. He was with him all the time. Moshiach said, look, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be rejected by the elders. I'm going to suffer greatly. And then on the third day, I'm going to stand up alive. And that was his vision. But, but instead of waiting for the vision, Judas said, you know what? I could cash this guy in for 30 pieces of silver. Are, you, are your eyes on money, my friend? Are you, are you thinking about money? Is, is money the thing that's in your, your uh, head all the time? And you're not thinking about the scriptures? And you've lost the vision? Then, my friend, you are backslidden. I'm sorry to have to tell you that. It's too late in the game to backslide now, my friend. Hallelujah. Night has far been spent. A day is coming. The day is ready to dawn. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. The devil saw this coming. Why don't you see it? You know, when when uh, preachers show up in Africa, the witch doctor tries immediately to shut them down. And there's usually a power encounter. And when the witch doctor comes out with his hands up and gets saved, the whole tribe turns to the Lord. On that morning, it was a Sunday morning. I was trying to get a message together. I was sitting at the computer. I was and I, I was I was in the back of the building, and I was in a frenzy trying to get this sermon together and all of a sudden the lord shut me down i'm talking about a a a i'm talking about not hypnosis i'm talking about a semi-conscious state i'm talking about what people fell into a trance. Also, Rav Shaul fell into a trance. One was in Jaffa, the other one was in Jerusalem. A semi-conscious state where the Lord shuts you down and then he speaks to you. And the Lord spoke to me. You say, the Lord spoke to you. Now, come on. Listen. The Lord spoke to Philip, told him that there was this Ethiopian eunuch, told him where the guy was, and told him to go to him and preach to him. And sure enough, he, he, he did that. Uh, the Holy Spirit told him that, and he did that, and here's the guy reading Isaiah 53, trying to understand it, and then Philip joins him and starts preaching the true thing. And that's what I'm doing right now with the Yiddish Tanakh. The whole symphony of the, of the, of the scriptures climaxes in Isaiah 53. All these words, there's about maybe 20 or 30 of them. They all come to this Crescendo in Isaiah 53, the Nasa, the scapegoat bearing the sins away, carrying them away, picking them up, lifting them off, and carrying them away. Uh, 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 all of this stuff. It's, it's all climaxing. Hallelujah. And so in this trance, the Lord spoke to me. He said, the front door. I said, what about the front door? And he said, get up right now and run downstairs to the front door. I got up and I ran down the stairs to the front door. Now, I'm not in a trance anymore, but I'm still in the spirit. And I've got a, a, a window there in the door. And and I'm saying, Lord, well, I'm, I'm here. What, what do you want me to do? 
He said, look out the window. I said, I, I am looking. I don't see anything. He says, put your eyes. I'm, I'm giving you the, the verbatim uh, conversation between me and the Holy Spirit. He said, put your eyes on the rental car, the rental car across the street, parked across the street. I had parked my rental car across the street because these demonized persecutors had stolen our cars. 1994 was the year that the cars were stolen. You get up in the morning, you look outside, and your car is not where you parked it the night before, and you're never going to see it again. And this is the message that these people were saying. They said, you go to that congregation, Beth Shalom, 1410 Coney Island Avenue, and you can kiss your car goodbye. And so they stole my car. They stole John Rosati's car. Uh, and the cars were disappearing, and the people with the nice Buick, oh, no way. It's hard enough to get them to come to, uh, listen, it's hard enough for me to get people to come to Beth Shalom on a Sunday morning, two Sundays in a row. Are you kidding? If they know they're going to lose their new Buick, they'll never show up. And the people knew that, and they knew they were going to be able to close the congregation down. And, of course, the devil wanted to close down not just the congregation, but the Bible Society, Artists for Israel International, and also the Yiddish uh, Tanakh. He wanted to shut all that down. Uh, because even though it was 1994, he could smell something coming that he did not like. And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, my friend. We're, we're dealing with demons. These people had demons. But this was a power encounter. Greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. So I said, Lord, you want me to look at the car? Okay, so I looked at the car. I was looking at the car and looking at the car. I don't see anything, Lord. And then, oh, yeah, why is that black car? There was a black car and a red car. One of them had his front bumper against my back bumper. And I'm wondering, why does he have his car parked like that with the bumpers touching? What's going on here? This is strange. Then out of nowhere, the, the other car starts backing up. And he's going to put his back bumper against the front bumper of my rental car. And because these two cars have got me pinned in bumper to bumper, I'm not going to be able to use that rental car. So they're sending me a real good message. Phil, give up. We're closing your congregation. We've already stolen your car and even your rental car. We have removed from you being able to use it. So you might as well give up. But what they didn't know was that Pentecostals operate in signs and wonders. And this was a sign and a wonder. The same thing that happened to Kepa or Peter on the roof uh, of uh, Simon the Tanner's house in Jaffa, the same thing that happened to Paul, the trance where the Lord speaks to the person verbally in a trance. You say, oh, so you're saying that God spoke to you. Have you talked to your psychiatrist about that? My friend, he did speak to me. And I these guys, when I opened the door and ran out there, I said, okay, you guys, you either move these cars right now or you're both going to jail. They they cleared out faster than you could say Jack Rabbit. And also, they never came back. And the persecution was over because the Lord was terrorizing the terrorists. And the, the group that the, the FBI, uh, they raided, raided their offices, and they, the group that is now uh, officially a terrorist group outlawed in Israel, uh, that group uh, that was trying to shut down Ben Shalom, uh, they, they, they were gone. And the Lord did it. Give God the glory. Don't give the glory to me. I am a schlepper. I am a, uh, a, a, a I'm the, I, I'm kind of uh, I'm so I I drop things. I, I lose my glasses. Right now, I don't have my glasses. Uh, I have short-term memory problems. I'm 80 years old. I creep around. 
people come up to me in the drugstore and say, oh, sir, sir, can I help you? Like, like I'm ready for the emergency room. Uh, so if you're going to give me the glory, my friend, you didn't, you didn't get any, you didn't understand anything I just said. Don't you understand? It's, a, it's, this, it's the Lord doing this stuff. The Lord dealt with Richard Braifstein while he was sleeping in Brooklyn almost 50 years ago. The Lord brought that burden from him to me. And then by the grace of God, by the grace of Almighty God, I was able to keep from really backsliding. Oh, I did some backsliding, but I mean real backsliding where, you know, uh, without a vision, the people perish. That that kind of backsliding where you completely lose the vision. No, I didn't do that by the grace of God. Uh, and I did wait for the vision. And now it's coming to pass. And when people uh, walking around in Williamsburg look at this U version, Yiddish Tanakh, they might say, man, this is good. Who did this? And they won't realize it was God. The God who sent the Moshiach to die. He's the one that did it. Hallelujah. And the musical notations in chapter 3 tell us that Habakkuk was a prophet in the Beis Hamikdash. And he was a songwriter, and so is Linda. And when you go to AFII.org, uh, you go to the music thing and you click on it, you hear her singing the song she composed. And if you go there and you look at the rabbi from Tarsus on YouTube, you'll see the movie on the life of Paul. We are artists, but we are for Israel and we are a Bible society and we are trying to get the Yiddish Tanakh a very kosher Yiddish, Hasidic Yiddish. Behold, as for the one that is lifted up, his soul is not right. So don't get lifted up, my friend. Don't think you're a prophet. Don't think you're a big deal. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. It says the righteous will live by his faith. Have faith in God. Though the vision tarry, wait for it. It will come to pass. Hallelujah. We're going to see it with our eyes. That's what Job said. I know that my Redeemer lives. And in my flesh, I will see him. Lord, I want to pray right now for all the people, John and Mark and Martin and and Esther and Dave and Gigi and Emma and Albert and the list just goes on and on and on. All the people on four continents helping me. Oh God, I want to thank you for them. I want to thank you for all the prayer warriors that are praying for us. I want to thank you for the members of Beth Shalom. These are the pillars that are holding the whole thing up. They're, they're holding the roof, uh, the roof up. I want to thank you, Lord, for my mother who dragged me to the house of God that I might find salvation. I want to thank you, Lord, for our Ukrainian preacher who was saved from what is now a war zone, a battleground so that she could preach in Russian and even Ukrainian and English and the Muslims that are coming. We're going to do a Passover demonstration on Sunday. We're going to show them the Korbani that they need to know about. I want to thank you for the couple in on Spring Street that are the Priscilla and the Aquila of the whole operation. I want to thank you for the guy that lives in Brooklyn again, who grew up in Kentucky before he came to, to Brooklyn. This guy, I want to ask you to use him 
mightily. I want to thank you for the African American who lives near Columbia, where that Shekhinah conference was carried on with Mike Evans and Arthur Katz, where I was sitting taking notes almost 50 years ago, and then going to LaGuardia to fly back to Miami Beach, and then encountering Richard Briefstein, and being given this sacred vision and this wonderful holy burden. Oh, what a privilege it is, Lord, to have a vision from the Lord. Without a vision, the people perish. Moses had a vision. He got all the way to the to the borders of the promised land. And he couldn't go across, but he was, a, he was given, the Lord was merciful and allowed him to go up on a mountaintop and see the, the, the realization of the vision. Hallelujah. Help us to go up on the mountaintop, Lord, and see the, the great vision of heaven, the sea of glass, the, the glory clouds, the Lamb on the throne, the 24 elders. Oh God, let us see the vision. And oh God, even if the vision tarry, let us wait for it. Let us wait on the Lord. Let us wait in faith. Hallelujah. Let us be busy about our Father's business. Let's redeem the time. Let's keep on the journey toward the glory that's coming. And don't don't let us get discouraged by anything that happens in this world because that's what Habakkuk learned. No matter how strong the Babylonians are, no matter how much more wicked they are than the Jews, no matter what happens to Yehuda or the Northern Kingdom, God will eventually bring the Jews back. He will eventually save them. He will eventually bring the Moshiach. He will eventually uh, take the elect to heaven. It's all going to happen. Don't give up, but hang on. Moshiach ben Dover, we thank you. We ask you, Lord, forgive our sins today. We ask you, Lord, to receive, that we might receive the Lev Hadash and the Ruach Hadashah. Yes. That we, that we might realize that without a vision, the people perish. But also, without the new birth, the people perish. Help us to see the new vision of what we might become in Moshiach ben Dovid if we will die to the flesh and stand up alive and come alive to the Spirit and open the Bible and as pure as newborn babes, as as newborn babes crave the pure milk of the word of God. If we will do this, Lord, if we will receive you, you will take up residence in the Mishkan of our hearts. And the Neshama, the Nefesh, will see the glory land. And we'll give you all the praise.